Hi, I'm Joel Lebo, and I'm here to talk to you about our paper, Scalable Evaluation of Multi-Agent Reinforcement Learning with Melting Pot. So uh, generalization is the most important concept in machine learning. And that's because whenever you learn from data, there's a chance of overfitting. Uh, by that, we mean that you will train an algorithm in one setting, but then apply it in another. And even though it worked when you trained it, uh, it will not work where you test it. Uh, but when this is happening, it's not always easy to detect it. Thinking about generalization, helps us develop workflows like training and testing methodologies and benchmark challenges that advance our field. Now in subfields where it's been historically difficult to assess generalization like reinforcement learning, we still aspire to make it easy to do so because we are machine learning researchers and that is what we do. Uh, now, of course, generalization is not just one concept. It, the, concept the specific concept of generalization that you use uh, will dif be different depending on what kind of formalism you're thinking about and what application area you're in. Uh, so for example, in supervised learning, you'll talk about independent, identically distributed data samples. Uh, and in robotics, you'll talk about uh, training a policy in simulation and then transferring it to the real world. Uh, in time series forecasting, you might talk about always about uh, um, effectively generalizing from the past to the future. And in reinforcement learning, uh, there, there are a bunch of different concepts that have been developed, mostly relatively recently, actually, of um, ways of thinking about zero shot transfer or adaptation or few shot adaptation to new tasks, where you train on some distribution of, of tasks and then test on other, tests, other probe tasks. Um, and there's been a lot of recent work on that. Uh, in re multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, the demand for generalization can always be decomposed into two sources. There's the demand for generalization that comes from the physical environment and the demand for generalization that comes from the social environment. Now, what is melting pot? Melting pot is an evaluation protocol and a suite of test scenarios for multi-agent reinforcement learning. Melting pot evaluates the social environment generalization. Uh, how does it work? So melting pot is, a, is an evaluation uh, framework. It doesn't really, it's not actually opinionated about how you train your agents. Uh, but, but you know, if we think about things like self-play, population play, of course, um, uh, it'll evaluate any algorithm that produces a population of agents. Uh, by population of agents, we really mean a distribution over agents. Uh, but you can think of it as like a population that all you know are familiar with each other. They've lived together. Uh, and uh, what does success look like? So uh, success in melting pot means that individuals and sets of agents sampled from the population will can perform well across a range of different social situations uh, where the individuals are all interdependent on each other. Uh, they can also generalize to interact effectively with unfamiliar individuals that they've never seen during training, uh, as well as familiar individuals. In fact, they can be all mixed together in, in different proportions, in different test scenarios. So the melting pot is organized around test scenarios. In fact, we have 85 test scenarios right now. Uh, each test scenario has two parts. Uh, there's a substrate and a background population. The substrate is the, that's the word we're using for the physical environment. Uh, and background population uh, is, is a, another distribution over agents. The, these agents are agents that we pre-trained with reinforcement learning and froze. And in each case, think of it as like, um, we pre-trained a background population to constitute a particular test because in the test scenario, they become part of the environment for the the focal population, those are the ones being evaluated. The agents being evaluated experience the background population as part of their environment. They're like unfamiliar individuals that have never been seen during training. Uh, and we, we choose them uh, to be like something a priori interesting, usually uh, to be each test scenario. So uh, this is what it looks like. They're all 2D worlds like this. Uh, uh, I think of them more like two and a half D worlds than like grid worlds because they're always partially observed. So agents always see only a little bit around them. Uh, they're directional. So they see kind of more in front of them than behind them or to the sides, uh, things like that. So, so it feels like it has more in common with like 3D world simulators than it does with most 2D ones. Uh, it's also at, at test time, you have to do it in decentralized execution mode, but you're allowed to train in a centralized mode. Uh, and the numbers of players will range anywhere from two to 16, but uh, most games have eight. Uh, so here's some more detail now on what it, what it looks like to, to use melting pot, what it feels like here. So you start with a substrate, that's a physical environment, like think of a simulator. Uh, and uh, you have some learning algorithm that you've just developed and you want to evaluate it. 
Uh, so what you do is you plug those two together and you train uh, a population of agents uh, in on the substrate uh, with unlimited access to the substrate uh, to cr create whatever population you want. Uh, you know, this is the focal population now, the one that we're evaluating. Uh, now at test time, you sample players from the focal population and mix them with the background population in, in particular uh, proportions. Uh, and each test scenario will have different pr uh, proportions. Uh, some test scenarios are what we call resident mode scenarios, where they're mostly players from the focal population joined by a few players from the background population. And other scenarios are what we call visitor mode scenarios, where they're uh, mostly players from the background population and they're being visited by a few players from the focal population. Uh, and you, you play uh, some number of episodes in each test scenario and you can calculate some statistics and that's what, what gives you the score. Uh, it's always the uh, reward uh, the sum of reward, the per capita reward, really, of the focal population that's being measured in the end. Uh, though, of course, there's many other things you could measure, uh, like equality and things. Um, uh, but we, we try to focus on one statistic just to make it a single well-defined benchmark. Uh, OK, so why is this challenging? Uh, so the behavior of the background population, of course, influences the, which behaviors are rewarded in the focal population. Uh, so that means that if you're, and, but you don't know what you're going to be faced with at test time. Uh, so you have to somehow during training generate a diverse enough population of co-players to train with. Uh, so think of your, your self-play population play algorithm needing to generate uh, players that are implementing all of the different strategies that are possible in the world so that then individuals in your population will have seen them and, can, and have trained against them and know how to uh, act alongside them. Now, what this doesn't mean is that you should always play Nash. Uh, if you think about rock, paper, scissors, uh, if it was actually just the matrix game and you had this protocol, then that would mean that would mean that you would have to play the Nash strategy, which would just be the mixed strategy of one third, one third, one third. Uh, but Melting Pot doesn't have games that are actually matrix games like Rock, Paper, Scissors. Uh, our version of it is a, a 2D extended, more complex world uh, where you have to like do a whole policy that constitutes playing rock or playing paper or playing scissors. Uh, and since it's all kind of interleaved, you know, you can see what the other players doing, you can see they're starting to play rock and you can then uh, start to switch to paper. Uh, so the right thing to do is really more to like scout what the other player is doing, find them and see like, oh, they're starting to play rock. So I'm gonna start to play paper. Uh, or if you know that they're going to do that, you could try to deceive them uh, by making them think that you're going to play uh, paper and then instead play uh, scissors. Uh, yeah. And that's that's really the right thing to do. So it's not like it's a you know this. It, it's not the the view from uh, from Matrix games isn't really I exactly transferable here. Uh, yeah. So why is this a scalable approach? Uh, so the reason it, the real reason it's scalable is uh, not that we have a nice you know way of defining levels or anything like that, which we do of course. But uh, but the important thing about it is that uh, here it's you're using reinforcement learning to aid more reinforcement learning. Uh, what you do when you create a new test scenario is you train agents to be the background population. You train a particular background population to do something interesting. Like uh, if the game was Prisoner's Dilemma-like, you would have some background population that's gonna do something, some kind of cooperation, and another one that's gonna do defection. Uh, and then maybe you'd have another one that tries to do tit for tat. Uh, and these would be things that you think are a priori interesting, but you would create them by more reinforcement learning. Uh, so the same kind of research that we're already doing is uh, is advancing our own uh, benchmark set. And this is a really interesting property because you don't have this in other places in reinforcement learning. Uh, most of the time when you have a, a set of reinforcement learning levels to uh, you know to function as a benchmark, like Atari or something like that, uh, and to create a new one, it's a, it's a problem of video game design. Uh, but here we have the nice property that uh, it's it's not a problem. It's not just video game design. It's a... Uh, it's also reinforcement learning, and that's what we do here. So uh, you can, of course, you can train background populations by whatever method you want, uh, and we tried lots of different things. Uh, the most interesting one is this method we're calling the puppet method. Uh, so puppet is a hierarchical reinforcement learning method. Uh, what you do is you train a low-level controller that will that knows how to achieve goals. You can think of them as options if you want. Uh, they're conditioned on an observation that uh, tells it its current goal, and we train it uh, in a setting where it's just kind of constantly changing goals. Uh, and then we manually write a high-level controller, uh, which in this case is a Python function that just sends the goals to the low-level controller. So this lets you implement behaviors of the form, like if X happens, then do Y. Uh, and you know, one example where we use this is to get, uh, get bots that are doing something like tit for tat. Uh, they say, you know, if the other player has defected on me, then I will defect on them. Otherwise, 
uh, cooperate. And it would be very hard to get that particular behavior into a background population if you were just trying to do it by like putting in the right pseudo reward and reinforcement learning or something like that. Uh, so it's a, the puppet method seems is a pop, is a powerful way to get you know more structured, uh, uh, interesting uh, background populations. Okay. So why do we care so much about whether this is scalable? Uh, it's a, another concept that starts with the letter G, uh, which is uh, generality. So uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning is uh, is you know a, a huge field, and it's uh, you know growing every day. Uh, there's lots of different topics being studied. You know, people study emergent communication and language, and more strategic competitive games, coordination problems, social dilemmas. There's also a large number of different application areas. Uh, you know, there's multiple robot teams, uh, distributed control, resource management, autonomous systems like self-driving cars, and my favorite, modeling human intelligence and evolution. Uh, and what we would like is to have generic multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms that could be applied across all these settings, you know, in a sort of off-the-shelf way. Uh, that's what generality should mean. And, and so making it scalable is important because we want to keep adding more and more substrates and more and more scenarios in order to cover all of these topics to, so that then we can be sure that our evaluation is really uh, capturing this generality that we're looking for. And we want, in the end, uh, to have Multipot grow to something that feels like the, the image net of multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, now, towards that, uh, we, you know, starting, to, starting small, uh, we observe that uh, you know, most research so far has been, I'd say, too focused on zero-sum games and common payoff games, which are sort of two ends of, an ex of, a, of a spectrum here. Uh, there's pure conflict and pure common interest. Uh, but most things, most situations in the real world are not like that. They're much more mixed. Uh, they have some elements of competition and some elements of cooperation. And so we tried to, to respect that as we were you know, putting together the, the initial set of uh, substrates and scenarios for Melting Pot. So we didn't completely. Uh, do that, of course. There are zero sum games in multiple plot. There are pure common interest games, but they don't dominate entirely. Uh, so this here is we've got one thumbnail picture on this slide per substrate. Uh, these are the zero sum games. There's four of them here. Uh, there's only one two player zero sum game. The rest all have more players. Uh, and two of them here are team based zero sum games. So they're, they're four versus four uh, team games. Uh, these two are joint reward, pure common interest your cooperation games. Uh, they're both based on Overcooked. Uh, these four are games that emphasize coordination issues. Coordination is very difficult there. Uh, and these are more kind of uh, social dilemmas that feel kind of classically social dilemma-like uh, with some tragedy of the commons elements uh, and some. Uh, some are more public goods-like. Uh, and then these have more of a resource management flavor to them. Uh, and trust appears in, in some of them. Uh, there's also some that have kind of a war of attrition sort of a concept to them. Uh, so we made this uh, chart to try to understand the diversity that we are capturing in Melting Pot right now, uh, with a, you know towards our aim of it eventually making it a, a comprehensive-ish uh, set. Uh, the way it's organized here is that you know the the columns are different substrates and the uh, rows are different um, tags, you know properties that we tag. The top part of it are you know game theoretic ish properties, uh, things like you know the corresponding interests are greater than the conflicting interests, or conflicting interests are greater than corresponding interests, or are the roles and teams symmetric or asymmetric, uh, things like that. Is it is it a perfect information game? Uh, in what ways are the players' strategies interdependent? You know uh, things like that. Uh, and then below, which is maybe the more interesting part, is uh, th these are a list of concepts that we think uh, could be involved in potential solutions or potential uh, strategies that agents would might evolve within these uh, substrates. And these are things like, uh, you know, a concept of reciprocity or resource sharing or, you know, would deception help them? Uh, you know, could would they do better if they could trust each other? Uh, is free riding an issue? That sort of thing. Uh, now, we don't want to take this chart too seriously. Uh, it's not a, uh, it's not that kind of chart. <laughs> it's more of a, of an initial guide, you know, just something we were uh, try to, to try to get a handle on, on what we've already got in there. Now, of course, th the main conclusion from it is uh, that we're missing a whole lot, uh, uh, but that's okay. It's an open source project. If you think there's something huge that we're missing, then uh, please add it. <laughs> uh, so there's a huge number of results, and I'll, I'll point anyone interested to the paper, of course. This slide is breaking it out by scenario, uh, but I'll focus more at higher level. Uh, so this slide is, is a, you know, has results uh, 
broken down by by substrate. You know, each substrate has many scenarios, uh, and also the overall scores. So overall, everything here, uh, the VMPO agent performed the best. We tried six different baselines, uh, baseline algorithms, and uh, three of them were selfish. Three of them were uh, um, pure pro-social um, utilitarian maximizers, uh, and uh, maybe surprisingly some uh, audiences, uh, the selfish agents tended to do better than the pro-social ones. Uh, that's not completely true. It's not true in all cases at all. Uh, you know, one example where it's not true is, is the cleanup game, which is a bit um, of a classical kind of public goods, social dilemma, prisoner's dilemma-like scenario. There, only the pro-social agents really get much reward at all. Uh, but in many other cases, probably the majority of them, the selfish agents do better. And there's probably a variety of different reasons. Uh, one of the big ones is that there's a kind of serious spurious reward issue because it's very partially observed. So if your teammates start getting rewards and you don't know why, then agents will often break. And that sort of thing happens a lot. Uh, but there's probably many other reasons as well. Yeah. So to summarize, uh, Melting Pot uh, compares population learning algorithms, multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms. It uh, tests zero-shot generalization to novel social situations. It currently contains 85 different test scenarios covering a range of different topics, and it's open source. So what's going to happen next? Uh, we want it to grow 10 times in size. We're planning to submit uh, to the open source project a large number of additional scenarios over the coming months. And our goal is eventually for it to become this kind of comprehensive uh, uh, task suite that can cover all of the topics of interest to the multi-agent reinforcement learning community. You know, it, we, In the end, we want it to be something like the, the image net of multi-agent reinforcement learning. So check out the GitHub page and please contribute. And thanks for listening.